Sharp Tongue Podcast. Beep, 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 beep. You're beep. listening to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse May Jessie. Peluso. It's a personal look. Well, it's not really a look because it's a podcast. I'm already fucking this up. This is kind of like a verbal comedy diary. A deep look into the crevices of my mind. It's going to get dirty. You might cry. You'll probably laugh. Hopefully you'll laugh. The whole point is for you to laugh, but you also might cry. I talk about my family. I talk about farts. farts. I talk about love, loss, comedy, how hard it is to make it in this biz. I'm a fucking professional. Each week it's something different. Sometimes I have a guest host. Sometimes it's going to be a movie companion episode. Sometimes I just ran about the bullshit I dealt with the week before. You never know what you're gonna get. It's raw, uncut, and funny. It's me. Jonathan on my team is actually just saying when you type fart on your iPhone, it automatically uh, <laughs> makes like surfer. a fart surfer <laughs> <laughs> emoji. <laughs> it's Fart it's Friday. Like you don't even know what that is. Everybody, Mr. Mudman himself. Shane What's up? Heath. If they just put an L on your name, it would represent everything that you kind of represent. People Shane on Health. our team call me Sean Health. That's like my like, <laughs> alternate ego. <laughs> That's who you are, though. Yes, I'm getting there. Were you always such a healthy... You're like literally, for your age, probably like one of the healthiest dudes I know. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Because you yeah, don't really I've, booze a lot, do you? No, no. I've probably had like 20 drinks this year. <laughs> I've had and 20 like, drinks today. And like 10 of them were last weekend at a bachelor party. <laughs> I was wondering that when you told me you went to a bachelor party, yeah. I was like, I wonder if he balled out. We went, we went pretty big. I mean, it was like a last minute bachelor party, COVID style, um, but rented a couple rooms at a hotel here in LA, staycation, went pretty big. Yeah. What did you feel like, because you don't drink, did you feel that like brutality that's after? The, that's Ugh. the weird part is like, I don't, I didn't feel hungover at all. Like the next day I felt actually great. So I don't know if it was like giving my body, my liver a break. Cause I partied a lot in college. Um, I don't believe like, that. Like I was, <laughs> what does that mean? Like, did you have like a cocktail? Uh, did you have, a, I imagine you had no, one was, wine cooler. I was <laughs> getting after it for like two years in college. Um, a lot of beer pong, but I think it was more like, I love drinking games more than the actual drinking. So <laughs> <laughs> I would just play those all night. Um, did you guys yeah, play drinking games at the, at the bachelor party? Yeah. Yeah. Was it just a bunch of dudes? You guys didn't do like the traditional <laughs> no. TNA? It wasn't like strippers kind of thing, no. It it like it was more like frat style, right? Like you just guys, are, you're just going crazy, yeah, just screaming at each other. Like I'm pretty Animal sure House. the bachelor he doesn't remember after 7:30 p.m. Like he was talking to his fiance the next day. Like I overheard him on the phone. She's like, "How'd it go? Like you guys go to dinner?" He's like, "No, we didn't go to dinner. We just kind of hung out in the room and partied." And it's like we fully went to dinner. Like there was like <laughs> toasts. There was like. <laughs> amazing food conversations photos doesn't remember it at all when you like, just said toast i don't know why but my brain oh, toast, literally like, <laughs> literally imagined toast i was like why did you guys have toast <laughs> like they the were toasts stupidest food to have <laughs> we were on a budget we had toast <laughs> is he Is that young? frat life um he's 33 that's so young to get married don't you think for me yeah i mean i feel like at least 10 more years maybe you could think yeah, about take getting your time, married take, take your time, time. i feel no. like you, you get married anytime in your early 30s you're just guaranteed to get a divorce but maybe <sighs> that's my skewed because your parents are still together my parents and grandparents and your, and your grandparents go yeah. out partying yeah together like both sides no yeah that's just and they got most of them i think my grandparents both got married when they were like both sides got married when they were either in their teens or early 20s. So like my mom's side, my grandma got married when she was 18. And then my dad's side, my grandpa was like 21. So you've had a pretty healthy perspective, perspective on, of long, on like love and that, that stuff. Yeah, for sure. So, but like, I feel like I have like a pressure. It's like, I got to find like the one because it's like these unbroken bonds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you don't, I wonder what happens to your family. Like, if you don't find the one, maybe you They're get like, murdered. Don't say the D word. <laughs> you get no murdered. divorces in our family. <laughs> <laughs> if you get married and then you tell them you're going to get a divorce, they literally kill you. Yeah. They're like, well, we divorce you. You can divorce her. It's fine. Yeah. You get excommunicated from life. <clears throat> I would imagine there's a lot of pressure to that. I have zero pressure. <laughs> zero. Like, yeah. there's no pressure whatsoever. Probably why I'm 38 and, like, still just kind of like, mm, figure it out. 
But I don't know. I think like what you see definitely affects what you want, you know, as far as like relationships go. Mm -hmm. Was there any sort of, did you grow up with any sort of like, what was the most traumatic thing that happened to you? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> well, nothing too crazy. I mean, my dad definitely has a temper. He was kind of like a, he's a badass, like fighter, like trained jujitsu from a young age and definitely would get very angry at me. And then me and my sister were very close in age. So there was a lot of fights between us. And whenever she would get sad or mad, my dad would come after me. And so that kind of thing would happen. Um, but I wouldn't say like traumatic as much as like formulative, like it made me who I am. And um, yeah, I mean, I would see my parents fight here and there and stuff like that, too. But that's so I just crazy. I can't believe that you have all of all of your relationships are still together. Like mm -hmm. I, it, it's just such a dichotomy to like I grew up and my mom, my mom had married <laughs> married the neighbor's dad i always say that because it just sounds funny but literally the guy who lived like four houses no, down the guy next door yeah like <laughs> pretty much yeah. the guy next door and so i uh, always joke that like on holidays we you know we were at my house and then we'd have to go to my dad's house and then my dad's parents were separated so we had to go to like literally 16 houses on the holidays <laughs> because everyone was divorced <laughs> we just did like this crazy like kamikaze star of david yeah. trip around to see everybody no it keeps the holidays very simple um and presents are great you know so yeah like, you guys can be all in one ho yeah. one home yeah yeah and your sister she's you said she's a celebrity hairstylist yeah i looked her up a she's little killing bit it. Yeah, yeah that's awesome yeah she's here in la and she has she has two kids she just got engaged how old is she she is 30 it's so young. Yeah. But you know what? I'm not worried about her. Yeah. I'm not worried about her because of how you guys were raised. Mm -hmm. See, that's the yeah. difference. I really, truly think like that's the difference. She was also like, she's younger than me, but like she's older than me in a lot of ways. Like she always wanted to get in that like family life, like have kids. Like when I used to party a lot, I would go over and she'd like take care of me and make me cookies. She was like my mom away from home. That's so So she's sweet. like older than me in so many ways. <laughs> and like I look up to her in a lot of ways, but you know, it goes both ways. That's just being yeah. a woman. I feel like we generally, we have to be older. Yeah. We have to mature just because things are trying to fuck us all day long and attack us. So it makes us have to develop a little bit yeah. more in each area. And, and most women I know are like extreme multitaskers and also have like, you know, the emotional capacity of like some sort of wild goddess or Greek mythology, like some creature from the past. Like there were very deep oceans of emotion. It's a lot to deal with. Mm -hmm. especially as like a dude like do you feel like you're emotionally developed like do you feel like you're someone like in relationships are you emotionally available or are you do you like kind of does it take you a while to open up it definitely takes me a while to open up but I think that's because I am pretty emotionally available once I'm in mm. like I do a lot of work like I think through meditating I think through art in general like I'm pretty I have good access to my own thoughts and emotions and um, so it can get kind of intense. Like I can fall in love, you know, yeah. like that kind of thing. Yeah. And your art, like you're constantly creating, like whenever I'm talking yeah. to you, you're like, I'm working on creating painting. How, do you ever, because for me, like doing comedy, it takes a lot of energy in, in creating yeah. something like this that we're sitting in front of. It's, it's something that you don't just whip up. Mm -hmm. Like does it, what do you do to prepare to paint? Is there, is there a routine? Yeah, I think, well, I think it's Picasso who says, like, you create, you create so you're available when creativity strikes. Like, you just constantly want to be in that space, even when you don't want to be. Ooh. So I try to always be in that. I always try to make myself create, even if I'm not feeling it, because then eventually it will, it'll be there. Um, but as far as, like, getting into that flow, I... Yeah, I mean, it could take hours before I actually feel like I'm excited to paint, you know? And so I have to just, like, fight through it. There's, like, struggles. It's kind of like a meditation practice where you're, like, this isn't really working. The flow isn't there. Then all of a sudden it hits, and then I can, like, flow for hours into, like, the wee hours of the night. Oh, the sweet flow zone. It's so good. That elusive flow zone. It's such a hard place to get to. But once you're in it, creatively, 
there's no Nothing other better. there's no there's no, no. other feeling it, it, it's like your 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 body your soul and everything else in existence is within alignment mm-hmm. and you're on this axis where everything's rotating around you but it doesn't come easy and you do a lot of work you do a lot of self work that's why i say like as a dude you have to know that you are 10 times ahead of like 99.9% of guys out there. (laughs) I don't know if you know that or not, but you need to know that because (laughs) it's like, it's ridiculous. The amount of self work you do, like you do jujitsu, you've got, um, meditation, breath work, the freaking plunge. I could not, (laughs) I'm still determined to, you know, get into that space. But what out of all these things that you do, do you attribute to being able to get into that flow zone or is it accumulation of all of it? Yeah. I think what feels best about that space is it almost doesn't feel like you're working, right? It's like, it's not coming from you. It's coming from something else. And so I do all those things to kind of create that flow. I I call it like from intuition, like it feels like it's coming from like a deeper rooted spot than thought. And so I think like having a healthy mind, body, it like makes room for that to come through. Yep. Um, So there isn't like any one thing, but like things like sleeping well, meditating, I feel like really creates that like space for it kind of like quiets a lot of the internal dialogue that can create like hiccups or writer's block. Um, The doubt that comes up. Yeah, the doubt. I I try to journal a lot, um, but in general, like doing hard things like all the time makes doing something like I don't really feel like painting today like really easy yeah Yeah. it is it is a constant um it's like perspective shifts all the time like setting the perspective because if I wake up and I just like jump right into work the spectrum of what is really stressful or really hard is like set by the hardest thing that I see that day but if I wake up and go and like sit in the cold plunge and then go to work it's like this isn't that bad like yeah, because your toes got frozen off. Yeah, at my 6 toes were about to fall off. Yeah, <laughs> so um, that's super helpful. It is. It's. It's also. Um, I think the constant shock and release that you put your body through on different spectrums. Like when it comes to cold plunging, obviously there's a lot more of your systems that are at play, and there's much more of like a healthy amount of stress that your body's going mm-hmm. through. And then there's a a come down. And then when it comes to like meditation, it's the reverse. So like these different things that you implement into your life. And I talk about a lot on the podcast about self-care and self-work and these things being things you can implement. It's they, they meet in the middle. They all yeah. sort of complement each other, but like sleep. It's, you're, you're a white belt at sleeping for sure. I'm not very good at sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do it to get a good night's sleep. I have to do I'm like a white belt. everything good. I don't yeah, know you've what, been sending a, me your, your like sleep scores. Is like, that a good belt? That's like the be like you just started. Oh, I'm terrible. <laughs> I started. sent you my scores and it's bright yeah. red. It's like I was like, are you concerned? Because you should be. <laughs> I'm dead. I'm sending you my sleep scores. Yeah. And it's like it looks like the hills of California. <laughs> it's so red. And you know, stress management, I think, is the core for me. The core of being balanced in sleep and getting mm-hmm. good sleep. And most people, they just they they dig their sh- they just shove their stress down. They're doing yeah. everything they can to pile stuff on top of it. But like if you were talking to, I was thinking about this on the way over. If you were talking to some guy who's like in the Midwest, like typical salt of the earth, American man who may mm-hmm. not have the access to the things you have access to, or just the knowledge of all the things you implement into your life, like a bro in, you know, like North Dakota. Yeah. What would you say to him to get started, to start to unpack the lifestyle so that he can achieve a balanced living. Yeah, I think so. It's kind of hard for some people, I think, because we're really adaptive. So like if you aren't, if you don't really care, like you might think I'm fine, like I'm great, but I don't, you don't know what your threshold is or you don't know what your baseline is compared to like what it could feel like. So like for me, when I started to cut out caffeine, when I start at least like afternoon caffeine, this was like years ago, before mud water, um, I stopped drinking coffee or caffeine after like 12. 
Uh, I stopped like eating before going to sleep, like giving myself at least three hours and I stopped watching any sort of TV and then I started meditating before bed, like those four things that are pretty simple, pretty accessible, like free, essentially. You're like eating less almost. Um, I started waking up with like this different feeling. Like it was like, whoa, like I feel refreshed. Like it was a refreshing feeling um, versus like years prior of feeling a certain type of way, but thinking that was just how you're supposed to feel. And then I think that just like opened my mind, like what, like how far does this go? Like how much better can I feel? So like starting with cutting out blue light altogether, you can get blue light blockers if you're like have to do some computer work late at night, but in general, like stopping, like once it gets dark outside, like you shouldn't really be taking in blue light through your eyes because it's decreasing your, your mind, your brain's melatonin secretion, which is really what allows you to drop into like deep REM sleep. That's like why you're getting <laughs> red scores on I there. Feel, I feel like triggered. I feel Like attacked. even if you feel like you're sleeping for eight hours, I mean, I have the same problem. Like I'll sleep for eight hours and then my, I like don't feel that rested. I feel like I was kind of like, like I wasn't tossing and turning even. It was just like I was, I was asleep all night, but I didn't get REM or deep sleep. Like I wasn't dreaming or anything. And for me, that's like a lot of, blue light like I wasn't didn't have a lot of melatonin production and then I didn't like disassociate my mind from the day where like it's essentially like going to sleep with all your folders open on your computer like your ba your desktops like covered with screenshots and you, your mind is like holding space for all that thinking that if it if it goes completely offline you're going to forget something and um like that's a probably an evolutionary trait that's beneficial in some ways but like you have to control your mind in order to be like I don't need to keep those folders open. I can close that out in my mind and that allows your body, mind to just go and drift off. So those things like really helped me. It's, it those takes a lot to sort of change. Cause like you said, people are like, Oh, this works for you me. You have to like want it. Right? You really do have to <laughs> want it. But if, if you're fine with how you are, I guess then that's good. But the average person is living a really unhealthy lifestyle. Yeah. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to express like I'm some sort of beacon yeah. of health. I smoke weed. I, I like an occasional glass of wine and you know, it, there's obviously a sleep issue because I'm on my device, but the things that I've imp implemented have made worlds of a difference for me. Mm -hmm. Even just like the meditation alone. Like I started meditating every day, probably almost a month ago now. And, um, you know, I did that leading up to the project I was working on for Netflix so I could be like fully present and like get into that flow zone. Yeah. Clear out some of those fi those folders that are open in my mm -hmm. mind, which meditation is amazing for. Yeah. And it made me fully focused so that I could, you know, for me, it kind of does what you described with cold plunge meditation in the morning for me. Um, because my brain is constantly working, it sort of cleans out all of this excess thought that doesn't help it's not um efficacious for any production or any creativity so it cleans all that out and then when i'm done i it's not even that i feel calm i just feel cl like clear mm -hmm. and um sort of able to i move more like water yeah after if that makes sense and then when anything stressful happens i don't even f i don't feel it my heart rate doesn't increase i can process it it's almost like i understand information more yeah yeah um, and so it worked great for the production and then like everything that happened with my mom, you know, that stressful, mm. you know, situation with her, it also helped me process pain and mm -hmm. I, I just made more space in my mind to be able to accept things and to, to process them. Not that I, I wasn't feeling them, but it didn't have such a detrimental hit to my system. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like creating, you're developing like the muscle of having an observer of your life like if you just live life and just taking in inputs and just acting and thinking and feeling from that that's like one thing that can lead to like patterns and behaviors that maybe aren't the best for you and then developing this like observer mind when you meditate you're basically doing the same things but you're also just watching that right. so you're like seeing the thoughts come through and you're just like hmm <laughs> <laughs> like that's interesting and ultimately maybe you're able to be like well, that's actually not true or that's not helpful. And like the way I acted isn't how I want to act. And you're able to like see it from that perspective, rewrite your mind in some ways or rewrite your actions in the future. And like, if you're not doing that, like your life is kind of just being run by outside inputs. 
So it's like your way of adding an input into your actions. Exactly. That's exactly what it feels like. It's like you start to have more control. And especially now in this day and age where most of our, our connection, communication, and just daily existence, there is a device that is in our hand. Right. And these devices have algorithms that are built to keep <clears throat> us on the device. And think for us. Essentially, it starts to just dictate how we're thinking. Have you seen The Social Dilemma? No, yeah. but I've heard about it, and I want to watch it, and I'm it's terrified. It's wild, yeah. <laughs> what's yeah, a, what's like your biggest takeaway? Well, I was just going to add to that. Like A lot of the... Um, the like things about improving sleep and like meditation and all that like to a certain degree it sounds like high maintenance like shit almost but really it's not like you're actually just doing less like it's where it's you're either doing less or you're counteracting all the, the high maintenance that you do outside of um the healthy things for you like you're on your phone all the time you're take you're watching the news like marketing advertising getting just like stressed out all day long and like these types of things is just like you have to kind of counteract some of that. Yes. So there's that component. And then things like not eating before bed, like that's not high, that's taking away an action. Like it's all it's kind of like simplifying, actually. But like when you describe it, like I do this, I do that, I do that. Like really a lot of what you're doing is not doing things. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's actually more simple. Um, it does sound like you're piling stuff on, like all the <laughs> shit that you say you're doing, but you're, you, it's, you yeah. add more. It sounds like you're doing more, but you're, you're, you're making doing space. a lot less you're doing in, in so reality. Much less. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Social dilemma. Do people like, do you think everyone needs to watch it? Is it that sort of thing? Um, probably. I think a lot of people already know kind of most of the, like what it's about. Um, like being like social media apps and these like the incentives of these companies are to attract and hold your attention and so there's just a simple like misaligned incentive to our personal health and mental well-being where it's not that like necessarily the people at the heads of these companies are like <clears throat> how do i like <laughs> get these people um they're not trying to like ruin your lives like they probably think that they're bringing i think the initial intent was like we're gonna bring happiness to somebody's life or or value like we're gonna create the Facebook like button because it creates community and these types of things but like it's there just wasn't a conscious understanding of human behavior probably that like could you couldn't even foresee what it would turn into ever like nobody really thought it would turn into what it did and so now we're at this place where there's like advertising dollars and it's like woven into society in such a way that it's really hard to dismantle and so they're they're basically like presenting it as like a it's like a pandemic. It's like an emergency. Oh it's like oh five years from now, like there was like five year or 10 year. It was like, if this doesn't get solved now, like we're toast kind of thing. Like you're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whoa. Whoa. That's your word. You're like, we're going to be like, whoa. <laughs> we're going to be like, not even say whoa because we're toast. Like you can't even say whoa. And, yeah, not, like, it's, and not like it's the toast weird. toast, like actual toast. <laughs> we can't even have We're going to be burnt toast. Yeah. We're not going to we be toasting will. about toast because we're going to be burnt to shit. Yeah. It Which already I don't kind know of is agree, happening. But yeah. It, they're just talking about how eventually it just divides culture and like that's kind of what you're seeing now. Well, because people, or, it causes it hysteria. Seems, mm -hmm. It causes chaos. And it's kind of hard to see because it's like you can't look at Instagram and be like Instagram. It doesn't like look inherently harmful. You're like cool, like sunsets and bikinis and whatever. And then you're like, how does this how is this like a threat to our lives? But it, it so it takes, you know, it, it explains all that. It does. It feels like it, it feels threatening into what it can do and what it is doing to children. Mm. You know, like seeing kids just. On, I, I just don't think young kids should have an Instagram account. What, why would a young child need an Instagram account? I, I know it's like the thing to do, but it just feels like that's where it gets a little bit shady. Like, it, think about high school. Like, when you went, when I went, we didn't have all of that. Mm -mm. And imagine just how bad it is without it. Yeah. How cruel kids are without it. And then you throw in Instagram where not only are you getting insulted in the hallways, now you've got like a whole page made about you know, whatever, yeah. your knobby knee or whatever the heck it is. <laughs> it's such a... Um, hashtag knobby yeah, knee. Yeah, <laughs> you've got hashtags that are about you. You know, you don't even... It's, yeah. it's such another layer of uh, something to overcome as a child that just feels like a an infringement on your freedom in that time in your life, you know? Yeah, it's like giving bullies like the ultimate weapon. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> bullies thrive oh, on yeah. social media. It's such a good tool for them. You know what's so funny is like um, after our, the couple times I've been on Rogan, he always says, don't read the comments. Like he says that to everybody. He's like, yeah, don't yeah. read the comments. It's not even worth it. And I like I don't really, um, but obviously you pass by a couple ones just when you're on your page or whatever. And I'll respond to like the meanest one. Yeah. But it not that I get butt hurt. I just respond in a way that's like, you know, either I agree with them or I just sort of diffuse it. And then they always respond with, oh, hey, I'm such a big fan. Yeah. What? So we we respond like we get a ton of troll type comments, too. And like people on mud are like, water? why do you say fuck coffee? Like, fuck mud. Like, stupid. Like, just weird <laughs> shit like that. <laughs> and, oh, people who are part of coffee's bros? Yeah, they're like coffee protectors and stuff. <laughs> and we, like, we have a whole channel where we share, like, Paul and I especially, um, but we, like, clap back on people. But we don't, like... <laughs> Like, I'll, I call it playing, like, Zor, like the matador. Like, they're a bull, and I, like, let them kind of, like, run through their own, their <laughs> their own, own aggression. Yeah. Their own bullshit. And um, it's super fun, and like, I totally agree. Like, a lot of times, you'll just see some troll just drop this, like, one line, and we're like, I was like, man, I'm really glad you, like, found a place to express yourself. Like, it's a beautiful thing. I want to give you a platform. Like, do you have anything more to say? Like, just really, like, let them go in. Because <laughs> they'll write, like, stupid shit. Like, you're gay. I'm like, I'm like... <laughs> Cool, like, let's go into that. Like, get, tell us more. Like, How gay do you think I am? <laughs> yeah, go, go. And um, it's been, it's hilarious because then other people jumped on board and they, like, clap back on them and, like, it creates this whole scene. So, I don't know, like, it's good not, it's good to have thick skin, um, especially with a brand, I think. With, yes. a, with, like, a personal brand, it maybe is a little different. Um, but when you're starting a company, it's, like, if you're not pissing some people off like you're nobody's falling right. in love with you either like everybody's just kind of like Meh, you don't really matter you got to make some emotions you got to draw mm -hmm. some emotions out of people yeah i definitely get been fun like um there was a message just recently some dude was like oh you know d sh all she does is swear it was like some it was on my serious xm show some dude posted on like my co-host page being like Oh man, she's got such a trash mouth. And then like he's he like swore in his message. Yeah. In my, such a fucking trash she's mouth. She's got such a fucking worry mouth. It's like, well, sir, just just calm down. Go for a walk. That's usually yeah. my go to. It's like just go for a walk. Yeah, yeah. But for the most part, these people just want they they need somebody. Totally. They're lonely. Yeah. People are lonely. And we say that too. We're like like it sounds like we're really happy you found a platform and everything to express <laughs> yourself, but really it just sounds like you need like some more attention or like someone to talk to. And like we do donate to an organization called maps. This is true. We do. And they're, they're developing like therapeutic usages for psychedelics, but this isn't ready yet. So we can connect you with a therapist. Like we write yes. comments like that. And it's hilarious. They're working we on the back. first, first trial. Yeah, they are. Yeah. <gasps> ready for like I'm actually doing, so there's ketamine clinics now. Yeah. So I'm doing a ketamine therapy session in like a couple weeks oh you have to let me know what that's like i want to yeah. do one so bad one of my someone i know is a psychiatrist who has a ketamine clinic in west hollywood right so yeah there's ketamine clinics and there has been for a while now but this is a place called field trip <laughs> and so they're developing these like clinics that aren't it, it's like a convergence of western and eastern so you walk in they have you know there's consultation rooms they have a, like an amazing itinerary that they put you through and then there's treatment rooms but more importantly there's integration rooms so a oh. lot of things that are missing from most of the clinics around here is like the integration part like they have like you walk in this is how it's currently done at most places you walk in and you have like a doctor or a nurse like administer intravenous ketamine and like cool have fun like they leave the room and you're in there by yourself and you just like go off into like space and then and then an hour later they walk back in and they're like cool, you're all done. And you're like, Ugh, like, <laughs> I need someone well, to hold me. Yeah. Mom. And then they, <laughs> and then they like, cool, go send you on your way. And I picked up a friend who did one and I was like sitting in the waiting room, just like watching people like leave the place. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit. Were they all just like, <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> where am I? Yeah. There's like not geo magazines around. They're like grabbing them and like, I don't know. It's funny. Just walking out crawling. So, so yeah, field trip. They have like a room. So you go and sit in this room that's like covered in rugs and there's like plants everywhere and like they serve you tea. They're going to serve mud water there. And you, uh, you like, you know, integrate with the experience for like an hour after. And there's people to talk to about it. And, um, and that's then the so way you, to do it. So you have like a session, you do like your little integration after, and then you come in the next week 
and you have an integration session. So it's not even, you don't get any of the, the medicine and you, um, you just talk to the therapist about your previous session and then you do another session and then another integration. So it's like slower process, but a lot more intentional. And so they're developing that for ketamine and then hopefully in the next couple of years, psilocybin will be offered there and MDMA. I mean, that's the way it should be. If you can go and get, you know, if there's a methadone clinic and there's doctor's offices where you can be prescribed opioids, like I feel like this is the, this is the future. For this sure. is the future of health. This is the future of people actually being cured. Mm-hmm. And I like, I believe that with every fiber of my being that, ketamine psilocybin and you know various psychedelics even marijuana like these implemented properly especially with like that sort of extra step of having you know what did you call how did integration integration can really seal the whole process because you know for people who don't normally do anything yeah they need some sort of there's got to be some sort of like bleed in and out like a little bit of got to be a a bumper there's like there's a couple of things there's like yeah, if you've never done anything like that, there's like no context. And so it can feel very abstract. And for some people, they could have like a really challenging time. And that challenging session might be exactly what they needed had they had like somebody to help interpret it for them. Yes. But like somebody might walk out like that was the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. I and, got like, attacked maybe by it, panda bears. Yeah, maybe it made it like way worse. Like a snake was wrapped around my head. A snake ate my and, dick. Um, yeah, so it's... That's a crucial, crucial component. How did your friend um, like it? So it was Paul. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. And he wrote about it. Like he loved it. Um, but he had no previous experience. So I had done like ayahuasca experiences and it's really um, heavy. In, like the importance of integration is like driven home. And for me, I totally resonate with that because almost more powerful than the experience itself, like the weekends that I had done it was like the aftermath and feeling, um, I guess like empowered to take inventory of a lot of areas of my life and empowered to start different habits. So like starting a meditation practice, like really eating healthy because I felt like I had a better relationship with what was going on in my body and mind. Like I can like hear how things were, um, like if I ate certain things, drank certain things, hang out with certain people, like I could feel it on a different level. And you feel like the integration process sort of helped you identify those different mm-hmm. like factors within your yeah. own being. Yeah, it made it it made it very intentional like the aftermath like the experience is one thing but like you just you, they they always call it like you picked up the phone, you got the message, like you hang up and like take action. You don't just like stay on the line right. or hang up and like do nothing about it. Like the real um, work start kind of like happens afterwards. And, like, and the intention, like intention is such a huge aspect of yeah. ayahuasca that I've been told because yeah, yeah. I haven't done it yet. But that's one word that keeps coming up. And even just with like any sort of energy work or um, anything where you're going into like a meditation, anything where you go inwards, mm-hmm. I think just going blindly without any sort of not plan so much as an intention of what you want to get out of the experience, you're really doing yourself a disservice to the experience and to what the medicine can provide. Yeah. And it's not even just in like in that space of like healing. It's like with everything you do, like Simon Sinek, who's like big in the business world, wrote a book called start with why. And it's like, if you're starting a business, like start with why, like, why are you doing it? Like, what is the soul of what you're doing? And ultimately that's because that's going to lead, that's going to determine like your success rate and endurance athletes, the same thing. Like, why are you doing this race? Like, why are you, there's like endurance athletes that do like 200 mile runs. Like you better have a good reason why you're doing it because at a certain point that like feeling of this is really tough. Like I will kind of want to quit. My foot really hurts. Super hot. (laughs) Like those and thoughts. Then David will come Goggins in. is like, You're a fucking bitch. <laughs> yeah. You're a quiet fucking inner bitch. bitch. So David Goggins has some like probably very strange, like dark wives. Oh, his wives I mean? are dark. Yeah. The darkest um, wives ever. Yeah. But they but yeah, work. But yeah, like it translates everywhere. Like when you're starting a business to comedy, art, like why are you creating? Like that's ultimately gonna be that underlying driving force. And then going into like an ayahuasca experience where you don't really know what you're gonna see. Um, like it's important to have like be rooted in like this is why I'm here so you can always kind of draw back to that and that can help like most likely that purpose or that reason 
is going to be like positive like you're trying to inspire some positive change in your life in some way and so like remembering that can kind of take you out of some dark realms and what what do you mind sharing like what a couple of your whys have been during ayahuasca trips like do you have like a consistent one or yeah yeah so i mean more recently i did a experience called combo and combo is uh they take a f- this certain frog and they oh yeah they scrape the, <laughs> they scrape this like it's, it's secretion kinda, from like, their yeah. back and then they'll burn they'll take almost like these incense sticks and burn holes they call them gates into your skin but it's basically like breaking through the the skin barrier into your bloodstream and they'll pack that stuff into those holes and it's not really a psychedelic experience but it like puts you through like it's terrible is it (laughs) every time i've done it i'm like what the fuck am i doing i've done it four times um but yeah within (laughs) within like (laughs) within 30 seconds you're just like you can feel it's put it feels like you you have an allergic reaction like you just feel this like like you feel your heart rate you feel your body temperature increase and then within like a minute your like stomach is just like wrenching to the point where you, you can't really sit up and you're just like dying and then you puke a lot so it's a physiological effect total physiological effect but it's it can be depending on like how much you take it can be so intense that at least my interpretation of it was it was like such an intense experience that it put me in flow state almost not in a good way but like when you're in flow state you're not really like thinking about Mm -hmm. what's going on you're just doing and you're acting kind of like you're just so in the moment that you don't have to think before you act and this was like that like because it was so shitty like I was I thought I was dying but I I wasn't even like am I dying like I I wasn't thinking about it I was just like (laughs) and then in in reflection I was able to like look back and be like that was a really heavy experience because like I wasn't even I wasn't watching the experience like there was no narration or anything like it was just like so intense and raw and brought me into that present moment which in a sense is kind of psychedelic like it, it is like psych- but yeah. I wasn't like seeing visions or anything I literally thought I was going blind <laughs> like it's <laughs> fucked up um so Can back you recommend to like this <laughs> back to like start with why like why am I doing this <laughs> I don't know if, I, if, if you're yeah. why if I want to hear your why <laughs> no um so because so I did this once like a year ago before going into an ayahuasca experience and then it was pretty simple like I was like I want to do this so I can kind of like find my why for the ayahuasca experience <laughs> so it's like a why for a why it's like a, it's like an inception why <laughs> yeah like I'm gonna go deep to find a why and come back out and meta, then get my why like, and then put it back in deep <laughs> yeah it's like you're weaving Which isn't that strong of a why <laughs> no it's a weaker why but I think it could be a stronger why once you put it in a different <laughs> yeah, depth yeah so um <laughs> So have a strong why. That wasn't a strong why. It was a really tough experience. But coming into uh, summer this year in May, uh, I just had like a really wild ride, like a, a really interesting, challenging relationship. Um, but ultimately, like that relationship made me see that there was like these patterns and cycles that I was like continuously putting myself in with different women and like types of women and in my own involvement in those patterns too being expressed and I was just it was like a a really cool insight where I was like whoa I'm like back in this same kind of rhythm um that I've been in maybe for like the past decade what is that rhythm I mean it's kind of nuanced it's like these it's like a feel like putting somebody in a position where they're feeling a certain type of way or like them putting in me in position where I'm feeling type of way chasing people who aren't available and vice versa like these types of things like wondering why that is and wondering if maybe like a lot of the patterns that we have are almost like addictions like we're addicted to certain feelings even if those feelings like conceptually might not feel good it's like anxious and like you're like people get addicted to um like certain aspects of love like jealousy even yeah of course where you're like you're addicted to that that sucks and, and like they're not in control really because it's just like biological chemicals that they've experienced and it's like and what they were raised with, like whatever yeah. they're, whatever they were exposed to as a kid, sometimes that that ex- that love exposure, whatever that love language mm-hmm. was when they were a kid, whatever they witnessed, they'll create the environment to bring them back to that because they think the jealousy Without is it, it's love. It's like subconscious almost mm-hmm. too. Um, so like meditation on a on like a micro level like does this where it allows us to repattern, allows us to see perspective, but like something like combo 
or like a near death experience or like an amazing experience, they can all have the ability to kind of like rapidly transform and like change oh, yeah. patterns in your life or like a, a loved one going through something like, boom, your life can be like shifted. Right. And so something like combo is really interesting because it, it's like a controlled life changing event. Like you're like going through a near death experience. You're like, but I can just do it next weekend. Like I don't have to wait for the near death experience and I don't end the near death experience. Like it's completely safe. Like you feel like you're going to die, but you're not. It sounds and, terrible. But like, but that's <laughs> awesome though, right? No, I know. It's, it's like, it's, that's where there's, uh, there's change rooted in that. Right. It's like, you can wait until you get in a car accident, hope you survive and be like, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> right. Or you, you hope can, you get that. Or real. you can just be like, I'm going to put myself through the next best, like the next closest thing by choice and come out of it with the same result. Right. Like and a so controlled, was, a controlled environment. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was kind of the reason was to like, I saw these patterns in my life and I'm like, I'm. I'm done with that and I'm going <laughs> to have this crazy fucking experience and hopefully like let go of that shit because I'm coming into it with that why like that's my intention. And so in like these plant medicine ceremonies and like that spirit world, they're really big on intention because of the experience being so powerful that if your intention is set, you know, if your mind believes that that's true and like the experience is so strong, it can create that that platform to kind of like let things go or invite new things in that's the power of the mind like people don't even it's totally realize. it's totally like joe dispenza world and like using yeah. these uh because joe dispenza always talks about creating um it's like creating these states in your mind that are malleable like he he does tons of like these meditation things in his books and that's what he's doing he's like creating like a shit what does he call it like a belief state yep almost and so, like, I think, like, intention setting and going through, like, these experiences is kind of the same. Like, you're creating this belief state. And, like, when I felt like I was dying and then all of a sudden I felt amazing, I was like, it's it's working, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, like, ultimately that's my own relationship with it. Like, somebody else might be like, this is bullshit. And for them, maybe it will be bullshit. And for me, like, I was like, fuck yeah, like, that that worked. But you also are the type of person who's a little bit more open. So people yeah. who approach it with a, this is bullshit mentality – they're the ones who could benefit. I mean, not that you don't benefit immensely from it, but mm -hmm. people who have that sort of mentality would benefit so immensely from something like this if they were able to step out of their self a little bit and open themselves up to the to the realm of change happening outside of their normal, whatever their health regimen has been. Totally. You know what I mean? Like stepping out outside of taking the Tylenol and drinking skim milk. Yeah. Like that sort of traditional American approach. And, and a lot of people look at it as woo woo. They look at this stuff as like, you know, witchcraft and yeah. it's really not. Once you start putting your, once you start really dismantling your ego and starting to put your, your fears and your, your beliefs into a place where they can be understood, like through mm -hmm. meditation and all that, that's when you start to break your behavior and change your behavior. Yeah. Like you were talking about, you know, wanting to evolve or alter how you've been going into relationships. Those things, like you said, are so ingrained. How the, re who you put into your life and how you approach them is so ingrained. Years of patterning. Oh, yeah. It's ancestral. Reinforcements, all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. And the reinforce, the reinforcements are reinforcing behavior that m more often than not is toxic. Mm -hmm. And in that toxicity is what continues that cycle of choosing the same person. Like girls will often message me when I do Dr. Peluso's, they'll be like, why do I, why do I date assholes? There's only the, the all men are assholes. And it's like the, that, that, no, that's not, you're, you're the asshole. Mm -hmm. You're viewing yourself as an asshole and, and you're I've attracting been an that for sure. We all and, have. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we all but that's have been why assholes. like I can see it now and I'm like, I want to, there's certain things that I definitely want to change and there's certain things about what I want to go after, what I'm like looking for that I want to change too, you know? What, so, yeah. what do you, would you say you want to change the most about yourself? Hmm. Right now it's like, I, I feel like I'm trying to find a good balance of being able to like enjoy, like have true joy in what I'm doing. I think it's like something that I've gotten a lot better at, but before like you said, like I'm constantly creating and I find joy in that. But sometimes it's like this, like I don't have a break. And one of the, the best things about the first time I ever did ayahuasca, it was like the um, it was the first time that I felt 
like I could just like do nothing. So like even I've gone to breath work classes and various things. And even in those classes, sometimes I'm like, am I doing it right? Like, or if I feel amazing in the experience, like I'm like, what should I get from this? Like, what should I try to manifest or whatever it is? And in this ayahuasca experience, like drank the medicine, was sitting around that you're in a room full of people and everybody's kind of having their own thing. Like some people are feeling really terrible, like internally, like they're puking and purging. Some people are feeling like intense body pain, like physical pain. And some people are kind of like just tripping out on their own thing. And I remember sitting in the room and it was starting to come on very strong. And I was just like watching people and I was like, I feel amazing <laughs> and like felt really, really good. <laughs> and I was like, maybe something's wrong with that. And, but like people always talk about ayahuasca has like a voice and it's not, it wasn't like a, like a grandmother spoke to me, but it was like, um, she's like, you want to go out Friday? I'm going out <laughs> <yeah>. with grandpa. <laughs> but it was like, it, like something came over me that just made me feel like, just relax like literally you don't have to do anything just like literally let go of everything and for six hours I just like lied down probably feeling the best I've ever felt physically people were going through stuff and I was like seeing like oh like I normally would have been like maybe I maybe I need to like drink more like I need to <laughs> like I'm doing something wrong like I always felt like I was doing something wrong, or I need to do more and it was like no I don't and it was a crazy feeling similar to like picking up the phone and like I saw it, like I have access to that still. Like I still have access wow. to that feeling. have been there here and there, but it's like this feeling of contentment. Contentment while having an experience. And so it's like this balance. And so when I'm trying to, like I constantly have things that I like to do. I love to paint, but I love to create all the time, but I need to like be conscious of why I'm doing it and making sure I'm doing it because it's like really bringing me joy and I'm not doing it for like some external validation, I guess. Cause then the p most pure, like you'll be more, uh, your being will be in the painting more than it just being a painting. Yeah. And it's tricky cause the output looks very similar, right? Like if I'm painting out of pure joy and fun, like I'm like creating paintings. And if I'm painting because it's like, I think people think I should be making more art or like I need to be doing more. It like looks like more paintings and so it's really tough to discern but it really comes from that why place that's like the only difference and that for a lot of people you know just knowing that having a why can give them I mean that's like one of the the more important things in life is like what keeps you alive like why mm -hmm. do you wake up in the morning you know what I mean True. like that people don't even ask that and I think it comes from a place of being humbled and like realizing how gratitude can sort of lead your day gratitude is kind of a grounding down into a why too right i think it yeah. is i do i think it is like i've experienced more gratitude but the the more i get humbled by life the more grateful i feel mm. the more hardships i go through the more i realize how fleeting this all is and how interconnections with people and what like just me continuing through my hard times how important that is for other people right and so i think like maybe people just waking up and feeling grateful for the day can help them discover what their why is mm -hmm. you know um well i want it, it might even be the why might be having more feelings like that like people who have a gratitude practice it's like from what i've read about people who suggest that it's like just remembering the feeling that you're like trying to create more of like you're a tuning fork and like if you don't like there's lots of things to be grateful for even small little things <clears throat> and like if you can like embody that feeling here and there like at least you know like what you're trying to resonate more with right yeah you're, you you're, go out and make more of that find things that create that feeling in you absolutely and putting yourself in an environment where that can be repeated right um we have a couple questions we have a couple questions from people. Now, these sometimes these are random questions. Um, this one I think you might have <laughs> some input on. I don't know why you would have some input on it, just because you're a guy and you have a differing opinion. E Papa 27 says, how do you survive a mostly sexless marriage? Everything else is pretty good with small kids. <laughs> you know, you want to tackle that one because you come from people who are still married? Not that you know about their sex lives. Well, it sounds like, no offense, but it sounds like your grandparents are still grandpa's smashing. grandpa's getting down. They're yeah. still smashing on Fridays. They're probably going out tonight. 
I mean, I remember not even when it was probably 10 years ago, like me and I was with all my little cousins and I was like the oldest cousin. We were going around grandpa's like guest room, like we'd play video games in there and whatnot. And my little cousin like sneaks around this little corner and finds like a box and he opens it and it's full of like nudie bags. <laughs> like, grandpa, what the fuck? It's like 80. He's like 91 now. But he's a Just dude. Just crushing it. He's a dude. Um, so maybe, yeah, get some nudie max. I you got to mix it up. I think you should mix it up. D- no more missionary. Just, just marriage, yeah. Um, it's sexless probably because you're complacent. Both of you are complacent. Mm-hmm. Um, get good sleep. Get good sleep. Get good sleep. I mean, use that as an opportunity to get good sleep. Yeah. You don't have to worry about the sex life. Bone it um, out and then sleep. Um, get a babysitter. Well, it depends. Are you trying to get like more sex in your life or you're just trying to be happy without it like i don't know Ooh, that's a really good question there's, there's a couple of different strategies there probably i think if you're trying to be happy without it that's going to take a lot of excavation it's gonna be tough that's going to be hard and you might have to become a monk and move to a mm-hmm. different country where men wear robes and you just hum into the universe for hours mm-hmm. try that or get nudie mags i would you know <laughs> it, it, i think Shane's right in this instance where you have to go one end of the of the spectrum. You either need to dive solely into figuring out if you want to be happy without sex or realize that maybe what's been working isn't working anymore. And mm-hmm. the hardest thing people, I think that the hardest thing people have, the thing that people have the hardest time with is change. And in order to make the relationship change, you have to change individually. In order to do that, you have to put yourself out on a limb and, and take responsibility and accountability for things that you've done that have attributed to the relationship running dry. And that's painful. That's hard to do to be like, mm, well, I guess I could put some lipstick on. Maybe I should shave once in a while. Um, but this is a fixable thing. I honestly think like marriages have turned around. It just takes... Maybe a little bit of kink. Maybe mm-hmm. you just need to figure out each other's kink. A good book, too, to read is called Way of the Superior Man. Have you heard of this book? No, but it sounds like some it's, real propaganda. It's not. It's, it's <laughs> not. It's the... Have you read the book, All Men Are the... No, it's the, not. <laughs> it's not about that. It's liter- It's really, though, about um, the masculine, feminine like polarities and how important that is in relationships, especially in regards to like sexual chemistry and how he gives you like tactical advice on how to like promote that and how to uh, dive deeper into that and also just identify where it's at currently. Ooh. So it's, um, I've, somebody gave it to me and I've given it to probably like five people in my life and they're all like, holy shit. And then I've had their girlfriends like find it and they're like, holy shit. This You're is saving amazing. relationships. They're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're like, um, whoa. <laughs> no, but yeah, it's not a, like he man woman haters club or like uh, men are better thing at all <laughs> uh, actually like they, they talk about like the masculine feminine that can happen in same sex relationships it can it can be reversed where like the the female is the masculine role in a a male female relationship even but it's just about the um i guess like the energy of those di- those two different Dynamics. elements yeah. yeah and how they can interchange and don't get scared dudes like it doesn't mean like your girl's going to be pegging you unless you want her to (laughs) just keep your mind open. I think people, you know, need to get used to like opening their mind a little bit more. Um, DJ Q 93. Are you pro second amendment? Um, is that gun rights? Yeah. Right to bear arms. I've shot a gun once. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Go for it. Yeah. I mean, why not? You know, I I do want to hunt. So like I've been, uh, I have a couple of friends who've gotten pretty into hunting. I feel like everyone's just kind of like taking like the Joe Rogan lifestyle and trying to like live that out. <laughs> but I mean, it seems Dude, to be working for coyotes. a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, Go try to find some elk. Um, my friend has sent me a bunch of wild game meat and it's been amazing. So uh, like I really want to get into hunting because I feel like it's important to at least experience what it feels like to kill the things that we eat. Um, and, and so lately I've honestly been eating like only fish cause I've pretty much only killed fish. Unfortunately, <laughs> <That> <laughs> uh, fish and, I've, I've been like veg- pescatarian essentially, you know? Um, <clears throat> and I really don't back, uh, like farming or, uh, what's it called? Like 
like farm raised farm raised cattle like yeah like like slaughterhouse yeah i'm not about that so i i really only want to eat the animals that like me or my friends kill and so that's going to be like i i totally support right to bear arms because i want to eventually bear arm i think that would be a you know a good litmus test for people like maybe what we should do is close all of the butchers like any of the butchers in the grocery stores and the only way you can get your meat is if you're able to hunt it yourself like maybe we need to raise the the uh, populations back (laughs) focus on that Mm -hmm. and then it's every man for himself out in the wild yeah. And then eventually, you know, women will get involved. There'll be a lot of hot pink bows. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think it would be like a sort of scenario where we can start to live off the land again and also have like really cute outfits. Let's do it. Just There's also thought. like regenerative agriculture where you can still like eat cows and chickens, but in a way that um, is a lot more ethical, I think, and sustainable too. But overall, it's probably going to make us have to eat less meat like in general i'm good with that less. yeah i mean i think the earth would be good with that too for what it's doing to the planet um so let's see uh jay shaw says no questions for you jess sending positive vibes to no pants nance I'll thank you that. they call my mom no pants nance that's her nickname because one of my friends one night um he stayed over in my guest room at my mom's house and he went to go to the bathroom at the same time my mom did and she had no pants on. And so they call her no pants. <laughs> um, let's see. What, what, what you want, huh? Mm. I had a really hard time what reading that. How to start a podcast. Can you share how you started and what is needed? Well, you just started a new podcast, but also video cast called Voices. You want to tell yeah. them about that? Yeah, so I'm starting a podcast through Mudwater where I'm going to interview, like I call it just giving a voice to the unheard. Um, So right now it's starting with interviewing people in the local community who are living on the street, essentially. Uh, Growing up, I lived in Santa Cruz. I went to college in San Diego. I lived in San Francisco, and then I lived here. So those are like all the places I've lived in every place had a pretty big homeless community. Um... Like Santa Cruz has like a very massive homeless community. And I think because of that, I was just like witness to the polarity of people's opinions about what's going on. And um, normally I kind of observe people who are like completely opposed to each other. And then I know that there's like some deeper truth there that I want to explore. And so with like homelessness, you hear people say like, they need to get a job. They need to like, like, what are they doing? They're just... Like, get the fuck off the street, that kind of thing. And it's definitely not that simple. It's very complex. So two years ago, I started just going out and, like, with my phone, just recording voice memos with homeless people around my house. And then I would take the audio recording. I would overlay it on a time lapse of me painting their portrait. And uh, I would post it to my Instagram. And people were like, holy shit, like, this is changing how I view people. Like, now they're walking by somebody with that context or frame and they're um, maybe a little bit more compassionate, but also like just interested in the solution because it's really easy to say, just get a job. But most of these people are, it's just a lot more complicated. Like I interviewed a lawyer, like everybody had like amazing perspective on life. They just didn't feel, well, it seemed like a common denominator was some form of like loneliness um, that led to a lack of community around them. And then some hardship came and then there's no support system at all and then you're out on the street and I think we're because we're very adaptive like once you're out on the street for a certain amount of time that's your life it's in our DNA to be like this is this is the new norm and almost like take pride in that and be like not only do I not want to like get out like I this is what I want and like you find you meet friends you kind of find pride and purpose in that community in that system so it's a really deep systemic problem um but on a deeper level too i i just feel like the same with like my physical body if there's an ailment like i go into that try to figure out what went wrong or like how to heal it and when you're looking at like the homeless situation like i feel like i want to go into the like that circumstance and i feel like the solution probably rests somewhere there where you can kind of backtrack it like how did we get into a culture and civilization that perpetuates this from perpetuates this to happen and how do we ultimately like fix it 
so yeah what i'm doing now is doing that on a larger scale like we'll be launching a youtube channel around it and um hoping to launch the first one in the next two weeks and you're also you're painting them and i'm painting them yeah 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 so we have a couple i have a couple downstairs they're getting painted large format so it's like four feet wide six feet tall like realism but also abstract in a way that i hope um showcases their personality in in a unique way uh but like the size and scale um ironically i think is like the size and scale that would typically be reserved for like the elite or the uh, like the celebrities of culture and so the whole thing there is like it'll be at like Gwyneth Paltrow's right office <laughs> yeah. she's like I'm so sad about the homeless paintball yeah <laughs> I was thinking about like painting them wearing like Gucci oh like, that's so Gucci jackets and dope. stuff like that that would be um, really dope but yeah I mean I used to paint like a lot of celebrities and like pop culture references and um like I painted a painting called the 27 club and it was like Joplin and Hendrix and all these people who passed away at a young age and I think like a very interesting thing is that like a lot of the people who are at like the top and peak of culture with like all eyes on them like they suffer from the same problems as the people who are at the bottom yep. who are like like it's kind of like lonely on both sides almost like you're so high and on this pedestal that you're also lonely and you suffer from anxiety depression alcoholism addiction and people are like, Insane. what's the matter? They had it all. Well, you don't mm -hmm. have it all. You don't. You, it, yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's the problem with the, the mindset is like, oh, you had so much. Why weren't you happy? Well, because all of that doesn't do anything mm -hmm. to your soul. If your soul's cracked, you mm -hmm. can't fill it with gold. You just can't. Yeah. And like people, I think the other part is like you had it all. But what is it? What is all? Like money and fame and. And all like, that goes away. Like that it obviously doesn't lead to like happiness it doesn't lead to so. sustainable happiness or mm -hmm. a realistic happiness where you know i think people think happiness is a place and it's it's a it's a state of mind but it's a fleeting state of mind and not happiness is exhausting like you're not mm -hmm. meant to be happy all the time so right. it's like also realizing what that balance is and to be grateful and and realize that when you do have those moments where you feel connected and, con and content, content yeah. that contentment should be happiness mm -hmm. not a g-wagon but right. if that also makes you happy go ahead but just yeah. know that that comes at a different cost start and it's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> 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 start with why okay shane heath if you had to say a quick why for why you get up in the morning what would you tell these fine folk hmm. what's shane heath's why i really like the opportunity to like change people's minds about things. And I think part of that is like inspiring people, like even like passing along a song that I like to somebody and having them be like, holy shit, this is amazing. Like, I love that transference of like something that I see into somebody else's mind. So like creating art, creating a company, a product, like all these things like really get me up every morning because I think they kind of start to do that. They do. Yeah. I think your art is beautiful. And I obviously, I love mud water. It's gotten the jitters out of my soul. <laughs> so I thank you for my reduced anxiety and mm -hmm. able to be more present. And thank you for your time. I'm sure you're going to be on here talking some more mental health yeah. soon. And um, Joe, Dis I can I never say his last name. Dispens Dispens Dispenza. Dispenza. Yeah. You guys have to check him out. Check him out on YouTube. His stuff is amazing. It's good. Um, I'll put the links to all the books that he mentioned and also Mudwater. Don't forget 10% off using code SharpTongue. Mudwater.com forward slash SharpTongue. Use code SharpTongue to get 10% off. Is that right? Get it. I'll put the link down. I don't know if it's right. You guys will figure it out. Yeah. We're taking it one day at a time. Mudwater.com, mm. right? M-U-D-W-T-R. That's right. We don't got time for the A or the E. Mm -mm. Bye. Bye.